Hey, it's 99 Cent Rental. I'm your host, Brian White. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Dave White. Dave, how you doing? Hey, new podcast. Yeah. Loving, loving new podcast. Yeah, part two of our big double feature pr- uh, pr- presentation. Yeah, and everyone's everyone's like, "Hey, why why would you make a new podcast?" And I'm like, "Why don't you shut up and stop asking questions?" Like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't know me. Why are you asking? Why are you talking to me? Like you don't got to know everything. Yeah. So uh, hey, it's uh, it's pretty hard to explain to someone who's never had the experience what a trip to the video store was like back in the day. Uh, the shelves were choked with absolutely bizarre crap made on tiny budgets, completely divorced from any recognizable reality, especially the one we're doing tonight. And it was the best. We intend to talk about every single one of them. And uh, before we get into it, if you're hearing this and aren't aware of our other show, Dave and I do a horror movie podcast on the weeks when 99 Cent Rental is off called Bring Me the Axe. If you want to keep up with us between episodes, you can find us on Instagram at Bring Me the Axe Pod. And uh, Dave's over there at That Queer Wolf. We, uh, we have a lot of fun. Yeah, sometimes I uh, sometimes I say smart stuff about yeah. movies. Most of the time I say dumb stuff about movies. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we got a sweet website now at 99centrental.com. You can listen to all our past shows there and read the transcripts. You can also contact us directly at 99centrentalpod at gmail.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions. Do let us know if there's a cheesy movie that you love and like to hear us give it the business. Lastly, if you like what you hear, you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. And we're on YouTube now. So you can search us by name and subscribe to uh, to us if you prefer to consume your podcast that way. And be doing us a favor by leaving us five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you listen on YouTube, do us a favor, give the episode a like and leave a comment. We love hearing from you guys. So we just want to get all... You're going to love my new TikTok profile. <laughs> uh, it's... Me uh, making funny, t- you know what? I don't even know what TikTok is. Get, keep going. Because keep going. I, <laughs> I was about the whole thing fell apart while I was. I was talking. about to be I, like, you didn't really do a TikTok, did you? But uh, yeah, Jesus Christ, I- yeah. So uh, yeah, we just want to get all this out of the way right at the top of the show, so that we can deliver you the goodness. So let's <laughs> give me a little taste of this. This one. Well, it's a sexy preview you're about to play. <laughs> this is the one we can't show on, too, on Instagram. Too hot for Instagram. Too spicy for Instagram, we're told. Uh... New York City, famous for its culture. <laughs> its street life. Its nightlife. Oh, and Jesus. its delivery boys. The sun has gone down. Oh, well, that'll be $12 and... Delivery Boys. It's an art. It's a science. It's service. Lots of service. What we have here is a failure to communicate. See them in action in the comedy that bears all. About why deliveries take so long. How are you going to keep me against my will? I won't. In fact, the door won't even be locked. Man, I can't hold it no more. Well, what do you expect me to do? Give me a couple of champagne glasses. I think it's a champagne. It's uh, warm and uh, flat. Now, in a minute, I'm going to take my face out of the hole, and you'll never guess what I'm going to put in this place. I don't like it. I, I don't guess. like it. Come on, get your hands behind your head. My hands behind my head? Both them. Both my hands behind my head? Now! Delivery boys. Come and get them while they're hot. Delivery boys. Boy, do they deliver. Coming soon from New World Pictures. Jeez. Oh, holy shit. Jesus fucking Christ. Now, I want to say, just for the sake of clarity, the reason that one of the reasons that this new podcast exists is because of this movie. I saw this a Last year, I think it was, and I was about a halfway through before I started texting you and insisting that you had to see this. Yeah, movie. yeah. Um, this one, I believe, kind of fell into your aware because of I. So I was listening to I don't remember. I was listening to something about the kind of origins of but the Barbie yeah because this coincided a, with the whole Barbie thing this summer. Yeah. Um, and it was, it might've been a little bit before that, but it was just sort of a, there was a show, it was a, um, 
a Patreon spinoff of Attitudes, which used to be called Throwing Shade. And for a while, Aaron Gibson, who's a very talented, very funny writer and podcast host, did a spinoff uh, a show called Dolls, where she would just sort of like get into various dolls. Uh, and she did the a Barbie doll one. And I I started to learn about uh, Ken Handler, who is the namesake of the Ken doll. That is the son of the creator of Barbie dolls. And the more I learned about him, I was just like, who the fuck is this guy? And then I realized he made movies. Well, two movies. Yeah. And I was like, well, I have to see these movies. Now, where do you suppose I found <laughs> the same place that I found it? Good old. Yep. yep. Tubi. Over on Tubi, yeah. where all good movies are. Yeah. yeah. God, Godmother to us all, Tubi. Yeah. So before um, we get too deep into Ken Handler, because I've got I got notes on him, and I'm sure that you've got shit. Because that is a sad, upsetting black yeah, hole. Yeah, I'm sure you've got some shit to add to it that I don't I don't have in it. But uh, but yeah, this this was by Ken Handler. He has another movie that I am pretty sure you cannot find anywhere because it's not really a, it's it is a movie of sorts. Yeah, it's a, a, a it's called a place without parents. I think. Place Without Parents, it's also called Pigeon. Ah, all right. There's two names. Um, and it sounds like it's real low-budget trash. Yeah, no. But uh, yeah, before we get, uh, just like a warning before we get we get rolling, we're basically talking about this movie from beginning to end, spoilers to follow. Uh, you know what? It's on Tubi. It's for free. You have no reason not to go watch it because I think- And we are going to go through beat by beat. You're still not going to understand this is, so... I mean, this is one of those ones where I'm going to sound like I'm fucking drunk or something. So let's uh, let's run the facts. This uh, this was this eighty four or eighty five because I keep getting so it's it's eighty five because okay, it comes I out. see that it was I believe it was produced in eighty four but it was released in eighty five so Correct. so here's here's some other uh, some other movies that were released in nineteen eighty five Death Wish three Ugh. I love Death Wish three uh, is that the one with Deanna Troy yes that's the one where she dies from a broken arm oh, from a, she dies from a broken arm. Uh, let's see. Uh, also that year, My Science Project, which is uh, an example of a movie that has an egregious abuse of the wisecracking sidekick. Uh, also that year. Uh, is that who's My Science Project? Is that um, so uh, Val Kilmer? No, that's real genius. Uh, this one is okay. I'm trying to remember. He fuck, I can never remember the guy's name. He's in that mystery science theater movie City Limits. He's the. He's the pilot in Top Gun who washes out real early on because he he fucks up the landing. I just I can't remember his name. Tom um, Skerritt. Sure, uh, and uh, it's not Tom. No, Skerritt. it's not Tom it's Skerritt. Not. Uh, yeah. Fisher Stevens is also in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so also that fresh off of the burning. Uh, <laughs> yes, but before he did brownface in uh, a short circuit. Mm. So uh, like also also that year Invasion USA. Uh, oh wow mm -hmm. yep uh way better movie than it deserves to be and uh let's see uh rapping came out that year as well oh well because, let's stay tuned we gotta gotta keep that fucking ball rolling from breaking because they couldn't do breaking three and then lastly zone troopers i don't know what that is oh no it's a fucking charles band deal okay. yeah it's got tim thomerson it's got aliens it takes place in world war ii it's fucking great uh, so let's see. Cast and crew. As we mentioned, the director is a guy named Ken Handler, who, like Dave said, he's the namesake for Mattel's Ken doll. And he sounds and and he sounds like he was an insufferable fucking jerk at best in, in his life. Um, his Handler's parents gave their kids Mattel stock, which basically guaranteed that neither of them ever worked a day in their life. Yeah, everything Ken Handler ever did was paid for by Mattel. Yep. Including, this, including movie. this movie. So where the real Barbie was a woman of leisure, much like the doll, Ken pursued art. And while he seems to pursue, uh, seems to possess some ability, he's also kind of devoid of inspiration. So everything kind of seems to ring real hollow. But yeah, his life reads terribly fucking depressing. Uh, he dies from AIDS related complications in 1994. And even in death, his family tried to cover that up. So yeah, fucking bummer. Uh, he was involved in music. He fucking bankrolled an entire movie. He would open art galleries to display his own photography. All kinds of. No, so I, I mean, 
finish your facts and then we'll get into this because I think it's a little more complicated than it seems. Okay, then that go because that's that's really that's really it. Like I just do a blurb on these people. Yeah, I mean, there's no like the um, the cast of this movie is no one you've ever fucking seen, uh, and everything else was done by Ken Handler and a bunch of people who were mostly known for making. Porn. Yeah, so that's uh, Chuck Vincent and Platinum Pictures. Who? Yeah, Chuck Vincent and Platinum Pictures made they 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 were started out as a porn studio. Uh, made a ton of porn and then tr- really they tried to transition and I, I think they did sort of successfully into making like a low budget soft core, like the kind of shit you'd see on like uh USA yeah, Cinemax in the middle of the night. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but like competent film people who like they, they were just sort of, they wanted money more than anything yeah. else. Yeah. One of the things I kept seeing whenever anybody would talk about Platinum Pictures was uh, their their hardcore pornography was far more sophisticated than everything else. I'm like, hmm, yeah, like, right. I mean, they made you know, like these were people who knew what they were doing and they were good at what they. Yeah, did. that's the thing is is this movie is utter nonsense, but it's a competently made movie. Yeah, and there's uh, and that is all. Chuck all Vincent. Chuck. Vincent. I think Chuck Vincent is dead. Yes, he died. He actually died of AIDS before I think Ken he, Handler. But, did. I think most of the people involved with, well, most of the people involved in the production of this are no longer alive. Yeah, they were making porn in New York City before anybody really knew what AIDS was. So it definitely left. And even that, like, that's a real sticky trail to go down. Like, it's a hard, a hard story. But the thing about Ken Handler, and I, you know, as I was watching this, Ken Handler is someone, you know, he grows up with parents who have made so much fucking money. Like you cannot overstate the impact of the Barbie doll on the market, let alone culture, but like the market itself, like it was so huge. And so he comes into this with tons of fucking money and uh, they just, his parents indulged everything he did. And so there's a, there's a sort of a, I don't know how prevalent this is anymore. You know, for queer people of a certain age, there is a drive to become an overachiever because your identity and who you are as a person is is sort of uh, deemed inferior or if not completely worthless. And so there's this drive to prove that you can be better than everybody else in order to sort of show people that, that you do have value. It's incredibly tragic. Um, but as I was watching this, See, his whole thing was like, I want to be an artist. I want to be like a real, uh, like a, a, a real sort of a, a renaissance. I was man. about to say so that because like, like he was like, you know, because everything from like painting and drawing to photography to music, like he was, yeah, he, he, he tried everything. But the problem is, is that he never really commits himself to any one of these things. Like if you want to be a, an actual artist, well, that shit's hard. To oh, do. yeah. And. And I, you know, I think we're sort of living through that now too, where it's like, well, I want to be a YouTube star. Well, great. That doesn't take any fucking talent. <laughs> but it's like, if you actually want to be a real artist and he didn't know how to do that because nobody ever challenged him. Nobody ever pushed him to do or be anything. Yeah. And as we see and in the production so, here, that also carries through where you can oh tell, God, you yes. can tell that he definitely did not write about a half of this movie, but he was happy to take credit for it. And so there's so many moments in this movie where you're just like, you can, you can almost hear somebody. I think I texted you this today. Like you can almost hear them at the, uh, you know, on the set being like, uh, you, sh- you sure you want to do that? Ken? <laughs> Maybe you want to rethink that. Maybe what if we tried it this yeah. way? Like you can see there are so many people just trying to steer him away from making bad choices. Oh, there's a couple of, there's, the like, more, there's some real telling on yourself moments in this movie too. Oh, Jesus Christ. A bit more than I've ever seen anywhere. Yep. But you could see he wanted to do something artsy. He wanted to be a, uh, you know, a, a real artist. And I, you know, as crazy as that sounds, I kind of get oh, no. it. Because I definitely understand that because I could imagine that when your life is as luxurious as his was, at a certain point, if you're not his sister who was happy to just fucking suntan all day long and go to fucking movie premieres and shit – at a certain point, you start to wonder, like, what does this all fucking mean? And what am I bringing to this world? And so I can certainly understand that even if you're not very good at any of this stuff, but you have the means to devote your life to it, I would do the same fucking thing. And that was the difference between, like, his parents, 
Because he was openly gay. Well, I don't know if he was openly gay. He did come out to them, and they were kind of like, oh, no, you're yeah. not. Don't don't talk like that. Yeah, apparently. Well, you should try marrying a woman. Yeah, which he did, and he had children, too. And, yep. like, but, uh, yeah, I think I think he said he, uh, the bio that I saw said that he came out in 1990, which. And, I mean, you know they knew before. They that. must Ever, have. I mean, of course they sure. knew before that. Because his diagnosis was probably before. Oh, sure, yeah. But. I'm sure you that I'm sure that his coming out was a direct result of like I cannot hide this anymore because at a certain point he stopped funding art and started like trying to fund like alternative uh, it becomes very sad. yeah tries to f- like alternative therapies in uh, treatment of of HIV and AIDS and, but it's and but I, it's, I mean like I have to tread very lightly here because this sh- I find this shit so fucking heartbreaking like I it's very hard oh my, to talk oh about oh my god yes I. I totally get that. Because imagine that your entire government tries to wipe you out. Like that's. Mm, oh yeah. Cause this was that peak of that, that season. Like, yeah. But yeah, I was I'm watching this. I'm, I, I, there's a, a kind of vague insidious lecherousness to this whole movie that I associate with like Larry Clark or Gus Van Sant. Like, uh, and I think to maybe a little bit lesser extent to uh, like the physique magazines of the forties and fifties mm. where the camera is just lingering a little too long on the bodies of teenage boys. And you're like, this, this feels more like this is about the director than it is about the story or the audience. Yeah. Like you start to feel a little bit gross about it, all. but I can still see like, you know, when, when Gus Van Sant does it, you're like, Oh, it's my own private Idaho. It's so artsy. It's like, yeah, but you know, he wants to fuck them too. Right. Like, but this has that kind of vibe to it where you're like, I don't, there's a sleaziness well, to this that given, I'm not okay given with. Given what you, you sort of, if you dig, you don't have to dig very deep to find it. What you find out about this guy is that he was probably, he probably fucked half the boys in this movie. Uh, yep. He had a whole casting couch thing. The And I think the reason that like most of these guys never really acted again because the thing is is this this cast is like 99 percent people who show up in this movie and then nothing else probably because he just never like nobody else wanted them because they were not very good actors they're not, they're not and they and half of them weren't even actors. yeah they're most of them seem to be gigolos but it, yeah. you know they he, he, handler cert- somebody was like hey what if we made break in but we did it with uh porn stars and hustlers <laughs> like he drove drove down to the chelsea piers and was like hey any of you rap boys know how to break dance because that's basically what he did do <laughs> and that's the interesting thing and you know it, I, it's hard it's a i don't want to get into too much of this it's a complicated thing but like this is what happens when you have marginalized communities mm. like when you know you see this with sex workers you see this with porn actors uh, you see with low wage workers all over the place. Like when we don't talk about what problems are, uh, and and you know how we can fix things realistically, that's how this shit happens. Like you know when you, you when you have a community, especially gay communities in like the late seventies and early eighties, where everything is like in hushed tones. If we're talking about it at all, you end up with um, a community that is so quick to protect everybody that they're unwilling to acknowledge like that some behaviors are not justifiable. And that's why you end up with people like, you know, like that is the same of what happened in the, the physique magazines in the hmm. 50s. And, and that's directly tied to Ken Handler, you know, doing these sort of photo studios because this is, um, you know, physique pictorial and Bob Miser and, you know, uh, manual uh, magazines, like there's uh, tons of these, you know, physique magazines in the thirties, forties, fifties that were really just gay porn. You, you just had to sort of like frame it a different way. And what happens is because no one is able to talk about shit, no one is able to be like, Hey, I think maybe what you're doing is not okay. You're like going out and finding these young men and you're exploiting their financial need and their desperation for your gain. Yeah. yeah it's, and it's, and everyone's so quick to be like, well, no, 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 that that's, you don't understand our world. You're so, you know, you're, you're marginalizing us. You don't get it. It's like, well, no, they are marginalizing you, but you're also being a fucking creep. And because you can't talk about that, we can never really address any of these problems. Yeah. And it's, it just, it's so, I don't know. You, this is what happens is you end up with movies where it's like, I feel like bad things happened during the production of this. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. Cause the thing is, is like with this, this movie in particular, it clashes with his aspirations as an artist. Cause like he considered oh, yeah. himself, but if you tell if you speak to people who knew him, he considered himself to be like a sophisticate. He was a, a yeah, nobody liked him. He was a fucking like, jerk. He was an arrogant yeah. asshole. 
And so for this guy to come along and make a movie that is basically dick and fart jokes from start to end, there must have been a relentless, there must have been an ulterior motive. And really what it comes down to is it's just, it's the, it's a, it's the power dynamic of, uh, fabulous wealth on one side and absolutely nothing on the other side. And yeah, it's exploitation. Like if you really want to strip it all down, it's exploitation of labor mm-hmm. and it's exploitation. Of yeah. Power. It's just, these were people who I'm sure were promised a bright future in acting, you know, if they sucked his dick or something, but like nothing ever really came of it. There were a couple of people who sort of went on to do other things aside from Mario Van Peebles, but not many. So uh, yeah, let's 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 get on to the cast because uh, speaking of Mario Van Peebles, he was busy as oh, he was busy as hell at this time. So he did uh, four movies this just this year, uh, nineteen eighty five, and had just come out. You gotta give him a lot of credit though because he he is the son uh, of a, a fucking trailblazer, yep. like a, a someone who really busted on the scene. I mean, Melvin Van Peebles was at this time, I think, doing two Broadway shows yes. simultaneously. Yes. And Mario Van Peebles is working on one of them. Yeah. Like he could have just sort of, he could have rested on his father's laurels and he didn't. He really went out and tried to build something for himself. And he did. I mean, he built a career. I guarantee a he was just, career. he was desperate to just sort of like get out from that shadow and like do his own thing because he, he, oh, but God, did he do some fucking <laughs> dog shit movies <laughs> from night? I mean, for God's sake, Jaws 4, 1985 Jaws 4. to 1990. He, he never said no to anything. Uh, like, and, you know, there is stuff before New Jack City and it's bad. Yeah. So like this is right after Exterminator 2. And so this. Was he in that? Oh, too? Yeah, he's X, the bad guy. Oh, yep. Exterminator. Uh, so, yeah. But the thing, the thing that I love about it is <laughs> as dreary as the background of this movie is, he is having the fucking time of his life as as Spider. He really is. He is leaning in and his character is uh, offensive <laughs> on many levels. And I guarantee that the accent was his idea. It was. It was 100% his idea. It had to be. And he will he will revive that accent in, in Jaws, Jaws 4. 4. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, in spite of that, uh, we've got a character named uh, Mr. Fast Action, who's played by an actor named Rodney Harvey. I loved Fast Action. I'm t- I'll am tell you what. Speaking of Gus Van Sant, he's in my own private. He is. Uh, he, is uh, he was discovered by Warhol collaborator Paul Morrissey. Uh, Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> so someone else trying to have sex with him, too. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, he picks up small roles. Rest in peace, Paul Morrissey. I'm, I'm not besmirching yeah, you. Small name. roles here and there until the 90s when he picked up a heroin addiction and died of an overdose in the late 90s. Oh, that's that's yeah. bleak. He, uh, yes, he got hooked on dope. He was on the Outsiders type TV show. I didn't even know there was I, an Outsiders. No, I was just reading about the Outsiders earlier this. Why would you do I that? I cannot remember. I think uh, somebody w- was talking about Essie Hinton, and I was like, fuck, I don't know anything about Essie Hinton. So I looked her up. Oh, it's a fascinating yeah. story. And so I looked her up, and I was like, yeah, yeah, let's see what the, what the background with the Outsiders. Because when I was a kid, I loved that book. I loved, I was obsessed with those books when I was yeah. a kid. But uh, yeah, Rodney Harvey, uh, he was also the thing that if anybody kind of the thing is, is if you see him and you were like sort of like aware of culture at the time of the 90s, you he's he's got a face that you might remember. Uh, He's very he looks like a he was for Calvin Klein. And so exactly when I looked at his picture, I was like, he looks like a Calvin Klein, a Calvin Klein model and and everything that implies. So so first and foremost, white. Uh, but also, uh, speaking of my own private Idaho, he picked up his heroin addiction on the set of that movie. Well, that also makes yep. sense. Oh, I don't know why you tried to make a, a, a Outsiders TV show. It's like you look at the, everybody, the Outsiders. That's the sexiest cast you're oh, ever going to get, Christ. objectively in any fucking movie right. Ever. It's just it's a murderer's. From Patrick Swayze to Diane Lane, you do not get better looking no, people. No, it's just it's perfection. Uh, yeah, so uh, because this movie has basically nobody else really uh, worthy of merit, sorry guys. Uh, the last I'm gonna the last, the last group that I'm gonna mention is actually the Dynamic Breakers, who were one of the original B Boy crews. Um, where which is interesting because he does for all Ken Handler's faults, and there are so many. He did actually make an effort to get like real Brooklyn artists. Yeah, he got the, he got the X Men. The, the graffiti crew. It's the X-Men, this yeah. group, and uh, I think uh, the graffiti artist Renee mm-hmm. is in this. There's tons of art in this yeah. as well. So 
Yeah. So like we've got like, and I think it was really kind of a product of, of flash dance, which has the, like one of the other sort of originators of the craft, the rock steady crew. Those were the Bronx guys who started it. Dynamic breakers were from Queens, I think. And so it lends an air of authenticity to it. Like the dancing, because what you see at the end is when our main cast who are supposed to be like the best breakers in the city start to dance the camera and the editing goes out of the way to mask the fact that they cannot dance. Yeah. You need to throw some people in front of them. So, so yeah, these guys, so whenever you see them, there's a couple of them who really innovated a couple of moves. And there's a guy who he's always got a do rag on his head. And he's the guy who sort of like innovated that whole like head spin move that you see a bunch in this movie. So yeah, um, you can also see the dynamic breakers in, I mentioned it in our last episode for this when we did Bronx Warriors, but if you go and you watch the documentary Style Wars, you actually see at some club, you will, you'll see dynamic breakers battling the Rocksteady crew and it's fucking cool as hell. Uh, but yeah, um, so whenever you- but you, know, we need, you know what we need in this country? More fucking dance-offs. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we fucking do. Let's, let, you know, we will settle this much like they settled their differences- Side street without Rumamba, <laughs> but also, but also by sheer very energy. aggressively dancing at one another. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So yeah. They, so when the, when the movie starts, the big whenever there's basically a faceless crew of people who are just dancing their ass off, that's dynamic breakers. They're yeah. legitimately very talented. So yeah. Also, we should say this is a New World Pictures district. Yes, it, <laughs> yes, it is. Because Ken Handler paid for this entire movie out, out, of, of, his own out of his own pocket. pocket. And somehow must have known somebody at New World. I mean, not that New World has discerning well, you know taste, what I'm You know what like, I'm sure happened with this was I'm sure that this movie went to market and they just, somebody, some New World rep saw it and was like, breakdancing's really hot, so we'll pick that up and then we'll, we'll put it into thing. But the thing about this is by the time that Breakin comes out and like, even by the time Flashdance came out and had breakdancing in it, breakdance as a style was kind of over. And well, and and you get that. Well, for, uh, Flashdance really only has that for one a scene. scene. Yes, it, but but that's the thing that most people really remember. And that was because I gotta tell you, if you're if you're too young to remember it, 1984 in in America could not get enough breakdancing. It was fucking nuts. And it's not just Breakin' and Breakin' 2, which were both produced and released in the same year. There was also Beat Street. There was... Um, mm-hmm. Body Rock. Body came Rock. Out, I think maybe a year Wild later. Wild Style. Like, there's a shitload of breakdancing movies that came out of that. Beat Street, by the way, is also, fucking great. Also, everybody, you get a really fantastic Peanuts Snoopy Flash <laughs> Dance uh, uh, thing. It's called Flash Beagle. It's Look it up. It's pretty. I mean, it's pretty cool. When you t- when you told is, me to go check do, it out, I was like, I'll I'll do that, and I did. Because I'll tell you what, it is. They use uh, um, I can't remember her name. The the body double for Jennifer Beals yeah. in Flashdance is the same person who does the Snoopy Flash Beagle dance in the thing, and they just do an animation it's over. It's like it. they rotoscoped that that dance scene. They did rot. That is exactly what it is. They rotoscoped the whole thing, and it looks so weirdly unnatural, but also so familiar that like I'm hypnotized. It's by cool. This. It's definitely cool because it is Snoopy doing the flash dance dance. Yeah. Yep. It's wild. Yeah. So let's uh, let's get into some notes here. So if well, I'm going to tell you some reviews on this one because this took me a long time to okay. find. Even hit me with those reviews. So the first one I found was in the Dayton Daily News. It is Terry Lawson from the Dayton Dayton Daily News. And this is 19, what is this, 1985? Uh, This is 1985. Uh, With its fascination with male genitalia (laughs) and sophomoric pranks, Delivery Boys uh, would like to be an inner city Porky's with dancing, but these kids seem a lot dumber than Porky's South Florida hicks and they dress for beans. (laughs) Wow, that is offensive on a lot of levels. (laughs) It's- the second one I found was from the following year because this movie I, I got a very limited uh, theatrical one, right. and then it kind of went to cable and VHS the next year when you start to see a little bit more traction, but not much. So this is from the 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 Hertford Hertfordshire Mercury. Ah, oh, the Hertfordshire Mercury. The basic idea is not bad. It's just that a bunch of untalented characters were given the job of transferring that idea to the screen. <laughs> Damn girl, how dare brutal. you? Brutal. Absolutely fucking brutal. Finish him. But also, the basic idea is bad. 
That's that's where you go. Yeah, it's a really terrible. Premise. Really, I'm sure we'll, we'll because nobody really knows what this movie. Yeah, is we'll, about. We'll, when we sort of tie it all together uh, in our final thoughts at the end of this, I'm sure we're going to have the same sort of thoughts. So taglines for this movie. Yikes! Oh boy, do they deliver? Uh, they don't though. No. They really don't. No. Uh, here's another one. Did you ever wonder why it takes so long to make a delivery? No. I don't. I just get angry about it. (laughs) These motherfuckers. Well, I don't care if they're being living statues or if they're being held captive in a hilarious sex uh, slavery. (laughs) Yep. But uh, yeah. But now that explains a few things. Like if my pizza's ever that late, it's like, ah, uh, he must be peeing in champagne glasses right now. Yep. Yep. I don't want it. Take it back. (laughs) Don't need it. Got your complimentary. Crazy, Brad. (laughs) Yeah. Got your complimentary. Crazy, Brad. <laughs> and uh, lastly, uh, it's an American tradition gone absolutely wild. Yeah, we never actually contextualized this. There was a moment, unfortunately, in the 80s. And this is thanks in very large part to Bob Clark uh, of making a sexy comedy. Yep. And by sexy comedy, I mean things that men thought were funny that women did not reject because they do not have the power to do so. Oh yeah. Uh, there is a, uh, there is a straight up just sexual assault joke in this fucking movie. Yeah. That was, no, I mean like it's the idea that it's just like, Oh boy, isn't this a wacky and hilarious? Nope. It's just right. No, this is, this is a uh, boy. Remember when we were in college and we used to, we used to pressure women into sex. Yeah, boy, those. Were- yeah, it is. It is the it is the Darth Vader Revenge of the Nerds scene, but the feature film. <laughs> it's that, yeah. like, a, 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 you know, it's inexcusable. Uh, this the idea, the sexy comedy. Uh, there's no redeeming qualities of them. Like, it's very much like uh, a, a large part of what we're going through right now, politically and socially, is. Uh, Privileged people not realizing that they are privileged and being confronted with it and they don't know what to do about that. So they get angry. Yeah. And that is that that is this all of this. It's just like these movies were never OK. I can't think of a single. They always relied on marginalizing and oppressing other people it was, in yeah, each, weird and aggressively sexual ways. That, and there was always, always. Uh, uh, an, a, an element of racism to it as well. So it was like, let's oh just God, let's yes. just put the tent over everything. Let's just be fucking offensive to absolutely everybody. I don't think even back in the day, like obviously when I was a little kid, like there was an allure to this sort of thing. But even as I grew up, like I don't, I never really gave a shit about fucking Porky's or uh, Animal House or like any any of those movies, like none of them really had any sort of lasting appeal. I saw a bunch of them and I'm sure I fucking laughed at them because I was an unsophisticated piece of shit. But like, I don't know. No. And I mean, that's the problem is like Porky's, you know, I and and I think when I first really got into Black Christmas because Black Christmas is my favorite movie, watch the uh, or listen to the uh, Bring Me the Axe episode on Black Christmas, where I will pontificate for a very long time. Uh, I am a big, big fan of Bob Clark. Bob Clark. Absolute unrated. Under- not a sophisticated person. Underrated genius of I, film, I, that's though. That's not fair. Because I'll tell you. He was a very competent director who was very, very, he made very good decisions yeah. directorially. I think he had a very uh, particular sense of humor that just does not work anymore. Mm-hmm. And Porky's is a terrible movie. Yeah. I mean, even if you watch it and think, I don't know, it's not that bad. No, it's not that bad, but it's a terrible movie yep. because of everything that it that it put out into the world. Yep. And this is what you get because of it. This is the lowest common denominator of all. This of is, this. yeah, like, this is definitely like. When you strip it all down, this is what you're doing. This is the fucking worst of the worst. So. And it's just, it's so, these sex comedies are just so bad. Yep. They're, they're just, they contribute nothing to the world. <laughs> Yep. So this movie is a vanity project entirely of handlers making. He paid for it all out of pocket. And it's honestly not really clear why. According to people who. So so Larry Ravine, who is the director of photography on this, he estimates because there's really no because it's all done out of pocket. There's not a lot of accounting for mm-hmm. it. And he estimates this is probably a three hundred thousand dollar budget. Okay, that that sounds about right. I wonder, and it, I mean, it tracks as you. I watch. wonder if this was like a money laundering thing or something like that, because that's the only way that I can really. I mean, swear why, why did they need to launder? They were the fuck the, the fucking dynasty. Like you don't because like, but also as as an investment picture, 
What the fuck would he have? There's to- no investment here. Yeah, there's no investment. So I don't, I don't fucking know. It just does not make much sense. No, it's just this is a straight up vanity yeah. project. So uh, <laughs> this is Ken Handler wanting to prove himself to the world without ever realizing, like, dude, but, if you want to be good at something, you have to keep doing. That's it. the thing. But like, you can't just do it once and be like, look, I did that thing. Now I'm going to go make a sort movie. Sort of given his attitudes towards, like, what you're not Lady Gaga, yes, but- or are you? <laughs> mm-hmm. Even Lady Gaga is not Lady Gaga. Yeah, but, uh, yeah come at me, internet. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah, uh, but given his sort of attitudes towards art and his kind of pretenses about himself, this lowbrow, like, unsophisticated sex comedy just clashes with his sensibilities. So it's like, what the fuck exactly was he doing with this movie? Like, I just don't understand. Well, that's what you have because- to wonder is whose idea was it to make, like, if you if you want to make your, if this is your My Own Private Idaho, Ken Handler, yeah. Why is it nothing but fart jokes and dick jokes? Yeah. Because at least Gus Van Sant, like, you know, as creepy as I find a lot of his movies, Gus Van Sant is an incredibly talented filmmaker yeah. who makes very compelling movies. I don't I don't like the way they make me feel. I think that's a little bit creepy. You know, is Kids a good movie? I don't really think, I don't so. think so. There's either. something going on there. I don't like how pedophilic it yeah. is. But yeah, but like I, I, I'm thinking of other just straight up vanity movies that I've seen, and I like a few of them. Like I think of like, um, like I fucking hate the I, I fucking hate the room, but the movie makes sense in the context of Tommy Wiseau. Like he was a spiteful, angry man who couldn't figure out why his friend was succeeding, but he wasn't. So he fucking made this this movie. It completely tracks with his attitude towards film. Um, it, it's the same here. I mean, this is the same. This is the person who in their head is so much better than they actually are in real yeah. life. Like, you know, I think he just, he's such a fucking narcissist that he's just like, well, of course I can do this. Anybody can maybe. do this. And, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. I love, I am, especially lately, I am so taken with the idea of people watching a movie and being like, hey, I can do that. Oh, yeah. And then they actually go out and do it. And their movie is fucking terrible. But they still did yeah, it. Yeah. And I think that's great. It's when you do it and then come back and be like, well, why don't you like it, you fucking Philistine? Yeah. Then I'm like, all right, Cause, cause, I think I'm done with you. Here's the thing, like, it does sound like we're being very harsh to this movie. It is not without its charms. In a way, yeah. it is a bewildering It's film. fucking, it's very, very. It is confusing. It does not make, it, narratively, it, there are so many problems. There are so many threads that they introduce into this movie and then abandon immediately. Yeah, yeah. And then you're, and you're, they're supposed to be like uh, really profound moments and they'll sort of come back to them every once in a while. And you're like, wait, oh, what? You like the, like the scene where the guy's praying. That one is a big one. And there's one at the end where it's just like, you know, I'm no good at this anymore. And I'm like, I actually don't. I, you referenced this one time at the very beginning. You didn't really get into it too much. I also don't give a shit. And also, uh, why aren't you breaking? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, according to people who knew him or were associated with the production, he had no love for hip hop or break dancing. And just by watching this movie, you can tell this. Uh, no, that's the weird thing is like, OK, you wanted to make a break dancing movie. But also a sex. And it does not commit. You don't seem to know anything about either. It doesn't one of commit these. to either of them, which is the biggest problem. Nope. Uh, no, every every break dancing scene in this movie feels like they got to the end and someone was like, "Hey, I thought this movie was about break dancing," and they were like, "Ah, oh, shit." <laughs> and so they went back and did a bunch of shit. They just jammed into the movie later. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, because and also getting to the sort of performative quality of the movie, the most prominent musical numbers are goofy pop songs. And also Ken Handler wrote all All of the music music is by Ken Handler because he was a, he graduated from UCLA as a music major. Yep. And I will say of, of every aspect of the movie, the music is actually the thing where you're like, well, it's actually, isn't that bad? Including the rap. He wrote the rap music. I mean, I have a lot to say about the songs, the, like the proper songs, but the, uh, the sort of film score, the cues, they're not bad. Mm. Like, just why didn't you just do that, yep. man? Well, because you're a fucking piece of shit narcissist, like who thinks he can do everything. I mean, so Larry Ravine, I watched the, I think it's Ravine. I don't, if I'm saying it right, I apologize, but he's the cinematographer on this. And I watched a about 25 minute interview. Yeah, there is a, there is, inf- strangely, I was shocked to find this out. There is a Blu ray through Kino, I think. 
I think originally it was a scorpion. Okay, but yeah, but it has this the the, the one. And I think so. I think Scorpion put it out, and then Kino picked it up when Scorpion went gotcha. under, which I think was a couple of years ago. And so you, because they must have bought that catalog for fucking for peanuts, nothing. yeah. Because there's, I mean, the, those movies are terrible. I mean, Delivery Boys, <laughs> the case, the crown jewel of the Scorpio um, library. And the only thing on this Blu-ray is this interview with with this with the DP on this movie, and he, you can tell. In everything I've read about Ken Handler, you can tell everyone is sort of tipped. Like, nobody wants to speak ill of the dead. And you can tell nobody wants, like, well, for probably for uh, legal reasons, they don't want to. But also, like, it's just kind of tacky and nobody wants to do it. And you can tell this guy is like going out of his way to be like, uh, I don't want to say he was a piece of shit, but like he he like straight up refers to him as condescending. It sounds like, you know, like one of the things he really goes out of his way to say is like, well, you know, he really he was very sympathetic to the dancers and, you know, all these guys who came from poor families mm. and who are mostly Puerto Rican. And I was like, uh oh, I don't think I like where this yeah. is going. And it was like, but when it came to the crew, he was not very nice to them. And so it's like, OK, you have professional people around you who you treat like shit. But. These other kids, it's like, it's a real Michael Jackson scenario where you're like, oh, I don't like this. Like, you're just such a fucking creep. And and I, yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, bit parts were played by high profile pornographic actors at the time. And And not even bit parts. I mean, you can tell who's a porn actor and who's not. Because they act as porn actors would act. Yep. And, uh, yeah. I mean, you can you can tell who's who. Yep. And so most nearly all of the cast appeared in this movie and this movie only. So except for the one guy who's in the Outsiders. Yep. So uh, let's the t- Outsiders, the TV, not the sexy movie, but the yep. TV. So let's let's get into this, shall we? So God, so, so, so <laughs> this was your pick, motherfucker. This is my idea. I don't know why I'm actually I'm put out here. <laughs> I created a whole spinoff just to talk about this movie, and now I don't yeah, want to do so it. This movie opens on what appears to be the basement of a church as a group of ethnic. What the? I I go oh yeah. We gotta talk about their la- the the delivery boys' lair, as it's, it were. It's like they live in a dungeon. I mean, this is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, <laughs> but but sexy. That or Kink dot com, but like yes. yeah. Well, we you know, it's a uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, by way of you poor. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, a group of ethnically diverse young men break dance to a song that's an old school hip hop beat set to lyrics that are basically, we're the delivery boys, we're the delivery boys, we're the greatest break dance company. But also, it's the catchiest fucking song. It is, you've it ever is heard. pretty good. It has been in my head for I two days. I can sing along with it. Um, the That Boy Will Deliver song is the one that I can't fucking shake. Oh, is that the is that like the real kind of brassy? Yeah, yeah. it's the one where like when they're yeah. like dra- the real Broadway strutting down Broadway yeah, moment where they're riding yeah. to or riding away from their delivery. They play that. They, the- like I imagine the all the all of the directorial advice on this was like, hey, uh, do it like Saturday Night Fever, but but sexy. Yeah. Which that's it. That's the extent of the direction. Makes, yeah, it makes kind of sense because like WKTU is uh, all over this movie. Like their logo, fucking everybody's wearing t-shirts. There's banners up. W came to you. Yeah. So Larry Ravine says in, in the interview, he's basically just like, I think he must have known somebody at that. And there's a couple other uh, product placement moments. Yeah. And he's like, I think he must have known somebody there because I, there's no other reason I, I can come up with as to why. these. I, personally, I think that it was there to sort of lend a little bit of uh, cre- uh, credence to the premise that like they, they know their shit. Cause if you're like, I had well, to look this up. Backfire. I was, I was, yeah, I, I had to look this up. Cause I was like, what is the significance of this radio station? KTU FM 92 in New York is basically the radio station that made disco. So like when it, be, when it sort of spread outward, it became this Giorgio Moroder is rolling in his grave. No, 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 no. Right what I mean is they're the one that exposed it nationally and sort of turned it into a thing and guido d'angelis is rolling in his <laughs> is he is he dead or is he just or is he, just in, a, he in, might a, in a grave i know one in of the grave is. going those, uh, those motherfuckers are talking about disco again yeah, but yeah so like 
They never give me the credit. Yeah, but that's the, that's the God, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, D'Angelo's family. I just take it back. Take it all yeah, back. They, uh, but yeah, they, uh, they, they're the radio station that sort of turned it into a major, major thing. It sort of spread outward from there. And the next thing you know, there's a fucking Sesame Street disco record. So yeah, it's it, that's that's the significance of, of this is what happens when you let the gays get involved in things. <laughs> no hip hop, just disco. Mm-hmm. So yeah, um, but yeah, uh, great great break dancing scene. Uh, but it's uh, like a, but this fucking scene goes. This scene goes on forever, so long. forever, and it is it is just fucking seahorses forever. <laughs> it just goes on forever, and it's just the opening credits. Yep. And it's dynamic breakers doing all the heavy lifting, like very, very fancy dis- uh, break dancing moves. But also, I think when you when you really present break dancing in this way, it, it it looks a lot less flashy than it should. You know, because you see how slow a lot of it has to be. Mm-hmm. Like the one point where there's a guy who like picks, he's got like two dudes hanging off of him, and he's sort of spinning like a helicopter. But like you can see how cautious they're being. It's like. Well, you kind of ruined the illusion a little bit here. Yeah, yeah I suppose. Um, it's like watching a. It's like it's the difference between watching, uh, like Bruce Lee in uh, big was a big boss man. Yeah. Like watching him do that scene where he's he's got the fighting dummy and he's just like knocking the shit out of it. He's so fucking fast. It's like watching that and then watching me do that. <laughs> like it's it's. It's a real hard difference. Yeah, um, I think my biggest complaint about the break dancing in this movie is that every single scene that involves it breaks down to the same fucking move where it's the, it's the yeah. up rock where they do the steps and then they get down a little bit and they do that kind of prancy dancy thing on their hands and their, their feet. And then they do a windmill, which it happens, yeah. which I mean, says a lot like this is these are kids like you're you're performing basically for people walking by on the sidewalk, we're going to throw you some yeah. cash. Maybe. Yep. So, or, or you're doing it for fun, but like, you're not doing, this is not a, this is not Alvin Ailey. Like you're not out there doing a big performance. Yeah, cause like, I, and so there's not so much you're going to Right. Do. So like, cause here's the thing, say what you want about the break in movies. They're fucking dog shit, but the dancing in those hey, movies, they gave us, they gave us the fucking Tina death scene in, well, it might have been no, vice versa. No, it was the other way around. In Nightmare on Elm Street. It was the other way around. Yeah, it's the other way around. Yeah. They used the but same set. The dancing in- Either the, way, we get an awesome death scene and we get an awesome turbo walk in the walls scene. Oh, fuck, man. I love that scene. The dancing and the break-in yeah, we're, we're going to get to it. Yeah. We're going to get to Objectively it. Objectively fucking we're, great dancing. And the reason is, is because those two guys are fucking dancers before they're actors, obviously. But they're really fucking- And in this good. movie, they're neither. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so now we cut to uh, we have a dude named Izzy passed out in his bed and his brother Max is trying to get him up so he can go get a job because now that he stopped dancing. Interesting, interesting thing about Izzy, though, is that of all the people, Izzy is one of the two people in this movie, in this cast that go on to do other things. Yeah, he's like still working and he's sort of like all so over. Izzy, he was on Oz. Like, I, it's really, it's a sad state of affairs. There's two things that I I... As a white person, I do not like doing this, but also at the same time, I it, it's so easy to do. It's like every time you see someone, you're like, hey, was that person on a different world? Oh. And then you go and check and you're like, yep, they were on a different <laughs> world. If they're if they are a, a Latino, Latinx person, you look them up, you're like, I think I remember that person from Oz and they were definitely on Oz. Yeah. Izzy was definitely on Oz. He was also on Guiding Light and As the World Turns. The other person is Joey. Uh, yes. Who ended up being a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Cause a couple of these guys, like they, they continue to work, but they're, they're crew now. Right. So, uh, yeah. Cause they're clearly not actors. Right. So, yeah. So the thing is, is Izzy used to dance with the delivery boys, but now he stopped and all he does is drink. But yeah, he, but you can put a pin in that if you want. It doesn't really doesn't matter. fucking matter. But, uh, yeah, but you see, there's a problem. The deliveries boy manager, Mr. Fast Action, is calling everybody. I love Fast Action. He's got the fucking funniest name. He is. Uh, fast Action is. Uh, if you Fully committed to the role. Listen, listen, uh, everybody out there who is a gay man, you know this guy if you've seen him. He is rent boy through and through. But he talks like, he, he talks like, hey, all of you guys. Yeah, you. he actually says you guys. But like, you look at him and you're like, oh. I know why you're here. 
Because the first thing you see when we're done with this intro, the first thing you see is like shirtless dudes. Yeah, everybody is in. And I don't like when I say dudes, I'm like, I I feel uncomfortable even saying that because like these are like, are they 18? Yeah, but barely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this cast is and I'm quite, like, is I quite guess young. I'm not OK with that. So, uh, but like, there's this weird kind of lost boys vibe to all of this, where it's like, y'all you live in, like you live in your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles dungeon, and you're all like a little too sexy for your own good. Yeah, and y'all sort of seem like you're gonna kiss each other at any minute. There's a couple of scenes, but you're too busy playing couple <laughs> chess checkers. But yeah, the the yeah, there's a lot of that where dudes are very very close together in very tight shots that like everybody's got like short shorts on and like half shirts, shirts and it's like god come on yep. man yep you're not even trying to disguise what fucking you're doing. jock straps everywhere so uh yeah. oh. so he's he's going to call everybody in for emergency emergency drills because he's a hard task masker who yeah and cuz you're all y'all are nothing but a bunch of all day suckers <laughs> <That's> right <laughs> it, the lingo in this movie is so fucking great. He needs great. the delivery boys in top shape because they're taking on a rival crew called the Devil Dogs at the great Brooklyn Bridge Dan- Breakdance Contest, and those guys are no joke. To demonstrate, here's a couple of guys dressed like extras from the Warriors who are going to do the exact same moves that everybody else does because they're also... Except they're going to do it in fucking March by Holy the water. Holy shit, it looks freezing. Everybody in this movie looks cold all the time. It looks so fucking cold in these shots. Like at one point you see someone pull up their hood and you're like, oh no, that is a thing they had to do. This is not a directorial yeah, thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. At that big, at the big d- dance contest at the end, like everybody is bundled the fuck up. Yeah. Because they, they filmed this in March yeah. and they are right. They're underneath the Brooklyn And that's Bridge, the so thing. It is fucking crazy. Winter in the city is particularly cold. So yeah. No, I mean, I like I, as a person who lives in a city in New England, Winter is very, very brutal. I can't imagine being out there in running shorts, you know, having to like act like it's fucking yep. June. Yep. So meanwhile, at Angelina's Pizza, actually, I think it's called Ben's Pizza, but I call it Angelina's because she's the one. Let's just call it Judy's. Pizza. She's in. She's in church because she is. She is Judy from Sleepaway Camp. <laughs> yeah, and uh, where this is where the delivery boys work. So Spider, who is the leader of the Devil Dogs, is played by Mario Van Peebles. Mm. Everything going to be Irene. Yeah, he's dressed like Colonel Sanders with a ridiculous Jamaican accent. Yeah. Here he comes. Fucking eye and eye in Babylon. <laughs> he is just ready, ready to go. Yep. And his is uh, he's like, hey, hey, what if a white person sang for bad things? <laughs> oh, no. He's that. Yeah. He's that yeah, guy. He is. And he's what he does is he goes in there and he's laying out his plan for how he's going to win the dance contest to Angelina, who she's got a look. That is very. She does. It's Rhea Pearl. <laughs> yeah. That's that is her yeah. look. But like at like twenty years old. She is Carla from Taxi. Yeah. Yep. So. And here's how you know this movie is made by a gay man because every single woman in this is either styled like Rhea Perlman or a golden girl. <laughs> yep, you're right. Yeah. So so you see. Here's the thing. There's $10,000 on the line. And if Angelina doesn't keep Max. And $10,000 $10, to win a to dance win. competition underneath the Brooklyn Bridge in March. It's, it's a lot of money, especially in 1985. So if she, That's a lot of money to me now. Know, for fuck's sake. Uh, so if Angelina doesn't keep Max, Conrad, and Joey busy with a couple of very complicated deliveries, then Spider will literally chop their heads off and shrink them. And and yeah, then this scene is a real yikes. And moment. then he'll also chop their dicks off and shrink them like he did to the previous winners, the big shots. And he does this by taking their shrunken heads out and placing them on the pictures of the big shots. Uh, it's it is. I, so everyone's real casual about murder and witchcraft. <laughs> And all of it's real yeah. racist. Because I got to wonder, like, since he's doing this, this Jamaican thing, did Handler think that, like, shrunken heads was like a Jamaican thing? Because it's, uh, it's a real thing, but it was like a South Seas Islands kind of thing. But, that, but so this, this is the weird, this is the weird thing about Ken Handler is, like, he is a, 
a person who doesn't think about anything too deeply. Yeah. He is just a, a processes culture very quickly. Yeah. In that very 1940s, 1950s way where it's like, oh, you're from the islands? Well, you must be a savage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, okay. Right. Because later on, we're going to get uh, Spider's Grill. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, when it comes up, I laughed out loud. Because uh, it's just, it's look, just what I know. teeth. What I know about this guy is that dude's got the freshest boogie moves. Freshest boogie moves. <laughs> freshest, freshest boogie, boogie moves. moves. I think I actually seen. have that 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 name written down. Oh yeah, because uh, they talk about a guy named Kenji in a little bit. But yeah, Angelina. By the way, um, look. I, here's what I want. I want a 99 cent rental T-shirt, and on the back it's going to say a bunch of all day songs. Or freshest boogie moves. Why not both? Can we get both? L- listen, uh, sound off. Tell us which yeah. one do you want. So, um, cause I'm going to order. Me <laughs> I love spending money on dumb shit. I have an entire apartment full of stupid, stupid crap. I think I'm getting these t-shirts one way or another. So yeah. So Angelina, the actress, uh, by the way, is also credited as the choreographer for the nurse striptease scene. Oh, yep. Do a right. double duty over there. Apparently get it, get the, it girl. But listen, uh, she's also in basket case. Two. I saw that. I was like, I can't remember the last time I saw basket case too. Now I got to watch it. I, I have seen it. I, I think. saw her, her uh, characters named Brainiac and I don't remember a Brainiac, but yeah, I would say I would go back and watch it, but look, I, I'm not going <laughs> to, the, the basket case movies are terrible. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. We're, I mean, we're going to get to him eventually on, on one of these goddamn yep. shows, but uh, I don't want to. So back at the Delivery Boy sex basement, fast action is busting everybody's balls for not practicing. And there's a guy there. I love that he's he's sort of like Mrs. Mack from Black Christmas. Like, I love that he's just like, all right, you guys, we really got to work this out. It's like, dude, you're not even dancing. What are yeah, you doing? As a matter of fact, he tries to dance later, and it is a sad affair. And he's got him like, at one point, he's wearing like, what what I can only describe as like a peasant outfit, like everything looks like it's made of like weird cheap burlap. Oh yeah, like uh, yeah, it's like he's got a, and it matches in a weird way. <laughs> right, so he's got that white headband on, he's got the little white cut off gym shorts, and then he's got a little white like cut off sleeveless tee that all matches and it all looks very very thin and flimsy. Look, Jesus Christ, this movie would be a lot more fun if they weren't all dead from terrible things. <laughs> I know. All right, I'm not going to lie. It's still kind of funny, but still, I, I don't like it. I don't <laughs> Yep. So there's a, there's also a guy of the Delivery Boys who's dressed in all silver. He's like a breakdancing Ace Fraley uh, that we're going to keep seeing in the movie. Yeah, I can, but I kind of love this, like, uh, what, what is this like? It's like a, uh, it's kind of like a Fab Five Freddy. Yeah, he's, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. He's my favorite character in the whole movie. Who's the one that I'm, what, who was the one that wore that? It wasn't, it wasn't cool. Her, it wasn't, um, well, there was, oh, uh, Ram LZ. It wasn't cool. Keith. Yeah. It wasn't, no, it was a little bit bigger than that. Uh, shit. Furious five. Um, uh, Grandmaster flash. Nah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a Grandmaster yeah. flash kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, he's got this. Cause he's got on the hat. He's got on like the big, it's got like a big kind of like a thriller. So yeah, sleeve, like the thriller, uh, at let kind of, yeah. So I don't really know how to describe where everybody that. else has this like denim jacket with the sort of delivery boys thing on the back. His is like this kind of like puffy silver vest with the delivery boys thing. And he's got these very, very spacey looking like silver boots. And he's got these weird little like silver ear tips to kind of make him look like Spock. And he's got a, a silver headband on and he's got silver like glitter all over his hair. Like clearly this guy was like a like a, a, a subway station busker that they were like, you, you got to be in this movie. And then he spoke to them and he, they were like, shit, you're a really great dancer, but you don't speak English. So but yeah, like you're basically one of the guys in Milliven <laughs> like that. It's that it's like, oh, this isn't going to yeah. work, but you're real sexy. But oh, yeah. God. Yeah. It's that. And I, I feel like that is this. That's the whole movie. Right. Because like, it's just uh, like, this is a good idea. Oh, it, no, it's, it's almost, not. But we're already involved. Yeah, it's almost like they, they got the dynamic breakers and they were like, shit, these guys all do the same fucking moves. And then they got because they got this guy cam- coming up called Kenji, who's definitely from one of the like the break crews because he's not really a character in the movie. But he's got a style of dance that's 
objectively breakdancing, but it's very, very different. And this this character, whose name is Scandal, by the way, he's also got a very. It took me to the very end of the movie before I realized they mentioned it very early on. That's why I texted you. I was like, what the fuck is that guy's name? Do they ever answer it? And then like right after I texted, they called him Scandal. And I was like, ah, shit. Okay. Now, I'm going to say I recently watched Hell Comes to Frogtown. I think I texted you and I said, Hell Comes to Frogtown is what happens when you've already signed the contract, but you're out of ideas. (laughs) That is this whole movie. Yeah, so it's just like, well, we agreed to it, but what do we do now? Yeah, so they're they're just filling in blanks, but yeah, they, so we're gonna keep seeing him. But he doesn't speak English, but he does speak, and he speaks like a minion. So he's got this whole. Oh no, it's very much like Mork from Orc. Like this is, uh, it is not a language. It's pigeon English at best, but not even. Yeah, that's why I say speaks like a minion. But like, there's a couple of guys. Yeah, it's like beep. Beep, boop, boop. <laughs> beep, beep, there's a, beep, there's a couple of guys in the in the crew who like whenever he speaks, the guy goes, "Hey, what do you say?" And the other guy talks to him like he's fucking like Han Solo translating Chewbacca. Yeah, he's just like, "Well, he's what he, what he said was like you can't look into the void too long because you know if you look into the void, it looks into you." And they're all like, "Oh, jeez, <laughs> yeah. this fucking guy." Yeah. We also learned that he's been spending a lot of time with a non-delivery boy named Kenji, who has the freshest boogie moves. And now we see Love we it. see Kenji dance, and it's it's a really it's a really yeah, right. I'm gonna write that shit down. For just boogie it's, a, it's a great line, but it's also it's a really like objectively sweet dancing scene. But it's also it pad? goes a little too Where's long. Pad? Yeah, like every fucking scene in this movie. Yep. So now we're gonna meet Con- because because if you really if you break it all down, this is about forty minutes of plot. It is the movie. So I have already kind of explained. And you need 85 minutes. Yeah, I've already kind of explained what this movie is about. That's about it. What's going to happen is three of the, the delivery boys are going to be caught up in these very contrived deliveries. And they t- it takes way too long, and it all culminates in a very predictable ending. But we're going to now meet Conrad, who hasn't been around the delivery boys much lately, lately because he's been seeing a girl. And he's white, and he's rich, and his dad pays for the costumes or something. But Conrad has a problem. He can't perform with the girl he's seeing right now. You see, even though he brought her to, I don't know, Chelsea hotel or oh something. My God. Yeah. Like, it's like a fucking he brings her to like the fucking worst. It's a, it's a heroin like, flop house. It's like something from a Roberta Findlay movie. It really, it, it is. It's like, Oh, well, well, this is, I think where, uh, uh, Robert Mapplethorpe <laughs> lived when he moved to New York. No, like, you know what it was? Is Abel Ferrara had just shot the movie and still had a few days left. Like, they were like, fine. Like, well, uh, we're done. We're done filming Driller Killer, but, uh, you're here to the end of the month. It's yours if you want it. <laughs> yeah. So he can't perform with her because you see, she's a pig and they're both pigs really. And he might, and I thought I was like, "Oh, is this going to be an acronym or something?" Nope. nope. He might. No, he means like a disgusting yeah, animal. He might be the biggest pig of them all, and he's all confused inside, which makes me wonder what kind of pig is he, and what's he all mixed up about. Well, I could tell you, but it involves revealing lots of things about a subculture you don't want to know anything about. <laughs> Just I. Guys. My note says, "Wait, is this a weird Christian subplot?" <laughs> Yeah. So uh, it might be that he doesn't want to follow in his father's footsteps into the boardroom or he could just be confused about something else. You know, who could say really? Yeah. Like he's really into Puerto Rican hustlers, (laughs) but he also wants to be the heir to the Mattel throne. I I don't know. I'm a spitball. I don't know. So (laughs) there is right, right there. There's Jesus. But this fucking movie. This is why I was like, I need other people to experience this movie because this can't be real. It's, it's this can't be no, the world we live ta- in. I, this, I've definitely had these movies where I'm like, I really got to fucking process this with somebody. <laughs> so back at the church basement, we get some very homoerotic vignettes of the delivery boys. Okay, uh, this is this this is so because we're back in their fucking basement lair, and it. It's everybody is an obvious amateur in all of this, but it is so homoerotic. Like they are about to kiss in every one of these. Right, because we get the scene. It's like dudes kind of like play fighting and boxing, and it's like okay, guys. But it's not just that. It's because also like it's the one guy telling Mister Facts in action, like I think you're the greatest, and then he's like, yeah, I think you're great. I think you're a great dancer too, and he's like, no, I think you're the greatest, and it's like, no, yeah, just that's that's the weird thing about this is like, look, I I I love sexual tension. 
I love homoerotic situation. It's great if those things go together, except what they're going for is conviviality and camaraderie. Yeah. Yeah. Not fucking. Right. And you're getting more, these guys are about to fuck than they are about to go to the arcade. Yeah, because in the next, because then we cut to another, when it's just two guys playing checkers, or maybe it's chess. I don't fucking know. You don't actually see the board. It's checkers. You do. You know. <laughs> it's so, you, you do. And so, they, yeah, they just, this is not a che- this is not a chess crowd. But they're, but the thing is, yeah. is they're basically, like, the board must be on their lap because they are sitting very close to one another. Basically, f- head to yeah. head. And they're talking about Joey, who reads... Likes to read Shakespeare, but he doesn't really understand it because he's Italian and not Shakespearean. Mm. Wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cut to Joey walking down the street, reading Shakespeare in a very stereotypical use guys kind uh, yeah, of yeah, way. Yeah. Meanwhile, sleep, behind him. a chance to dream. Therein lies the rub. Behind him. <laughs> Behind him is a domestic what violence the fuck scene is happening unfolding. There? <laughs> and I can only imagine this is just some shit that I, was actually happening on I the I know. Like, I cannot imagine that that was a directorial decision that, that, that was literally happening. Like, there are times when I will be walking down. Just the other day, I was walking down the street and I passed a couple who seemed to be having a very heated argument. And I, for a minute, I was like, I don't want to be one of those people, but I'm very curious. So I sort of kept an ear open as I walked. And it's one of those moments where you're like, ah, should I go back? And uh, I don't know. I don't want to get involved. But this feels like a real, real life moment unfolding behind him because the guy is like pushing this lady around. But again, hey, it's just jokes, man. <laughs> yeah. It's just a sex comedy. No, it's a romp. It's, it, it's just a romp. These are just the things you see in the city. So as per, as per, I know Jesus like like you said like I had a, when I lived in Florida I had this couple who lived downstairs from me who had just yeah. they're married they fucking yeah. hated each other and they used to fist fight in the streets to such a degree and I believe one time their child got stuck in a giant dumpster and you had to pull him out <laughs> yep that's it yeah that family was crazy they're the ones who were like oh you're from the north and I said yeah and they went we've got family up north and I said oh shit yeah we're from and they went Jacksonville and I'm like. That's north of here. Yep. So, yeah, very. <laughs> hey, look, Jacksonville, New Hampshire, what's the difference, yeah, honestly? I know. So, uh, yeah, as promised, Max shows up to Angelina's to work and get Izzy a job, and she falls for Izzy on site. Because, again, we're pushing this Izzy thing, and I'm like, who the fuck is yeah. Izzy? And she's a, uh, well, she, she falls for him on site while giving Max the delivery that's supposed to keep him so busy that he can't dance tonight. Right, because in case everybody forgot, uh, back in Babylon, um, Spider is trying to keep them from getting to the dance competition or whatever. I honestly, the first time I watched this movie, I got to the end and I was like, wait, what the fuck does any of this have to do with Angela or Angelina or whatever the fuck her name is? Yeah, so she was central. Because it's so vague. (laughs) Right, so because he he comes in and he they have this scene where he sort of explains it, but doing that sort of like uh, uh, tough guy gangster thing where it's like I'm telling you a story, but I mean something else. So that's yeah, you know, like it'd be it'd be a real shame if your dance crew ended up with tiny penises and heads. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, everything gonna be Irie. <laughs> yeah. So down by the Brooklyn Bridge, I will I will give him credit. I will give him credit for his. Uh, Jamaican accent. I am one who loves. I an love accent. it. It's very. I'm not good yeah. at it. I never will be. It, it can easily slip into Italian, and he pretty much maintains it till yep. the end. He commits, and I, I mean, two two hilarious offenses. He's got these two. He's got these two henchmen. Also, a guy named Jazz Mace and a guy named Wild Man, and they're also going to do some really offensive shit. <laughs> And oh my god, they are! And you know, do you remember the uh, um, Super Mario Brothers live action television oh, yeah. show with, Ca- with Captain Lou Albano? Albano? It's basically that, where it's just like you guys are playing the worst possible stereotypes. Yeah. So yeah, down by the and the thing is, is the, oh, I think one of the, the most jarring qualities of this movie is they're constantly cutting away from the main story to just show you some dancing, and this happens again. So. But this is what I mean about like that, like they got to the end and they were like, uh, I thought this movie was about dancing. Yeah. 
And they were like, oh, no. Okay, I guess we got to go shoot some other shit. Because all the, with the exception of that opening scene in the church, I guess, and then the end dance battle, there's like, you feel like there's no, it's, it just feels all jammed into it's the all movie, be, it's all like, here's a, apropos of nothing here's some fucking break yeah it's all b-roll you know like they just they just stuffed it in there to kind of pad it out yeah, yeah. and it's like it is it, the, everything about this movie is like uh it, it is the continuity is just constantly interrupted <laughs> yep yeah so in a way that is so jarring that you're just like, I, what am I watching? There, I, I think the very first time I watched this, I watched it in several sessions because I just could not fucking pay attention to it because it kept taking me out of the action and showing me something that just does not matter. So now it's the quality of a good director. Yeah, so now Max delivers the pizza as ordered to an uptown building where he meets the housekeeper, Tina, and is then. Now, this house, this is uh, Ken Handler's actual house. Oh, no shit. It's a very fancy that house. That they were moving out of at the time because apparently the neighbors complained too much about his wife cooking too much garlic. Huh. And I thought, is that a euphemism for your husband bringing home too much rough tree? <laughs> yeah. His his dates don't uh, belong in this part of town, because the, the, it is a, uh, a, a fantastical home. I mean, it's a gorgeous house. I mean, in an eighties kind of way. Yeah, it looks like a Vanderbilt mansion kind of thing. Like it's very yeah, uh, because it is. I mean, yeah. But they were just like, well, I guess we'll get a few more weeks out of it. Yeah. So he's then directed to the upper levels of the place by a woman's voice, and when he gets there, he finds a woman who intends to have sex with him. Apparently, she gets off uh, the, on f- the big reveal. Though is just sort of like uh, it's someone's mom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like it's supposed to be like ah, uh, here's a real sexy lady, and it's like oh, okay, this is a sexy lady. If you don't know what a sexy lady it's, is, it's a Sears catalog version of a sexy lady. Yeah, it is a very. It's like um, it's kind of like uh, who was Zora in in Blade Runner? Joanna Cassidy. Yeah. It's sort of like Joanna Cassidy's character in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, <laughs> but frumpy. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sort of like, you're supposed to be sexy, I think. Yeah. It's a sexy lady, right? You, you think? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So apparently she gets up. Shoulder pads and all. Oh my God, dude. That fucking blazer at the, when he makes his escape. Apparently she gets off on fucking poor young men, which might unfortunately be a bit of the director telling on himself. Yeah. Here's the big, this is the the real big reveal because she says, are you on the welfare? Yep. Now this, this is uh, insanely classist and defensive as shit, but also pretty much where Ken Handler was coming. From. Yeah. Yeah. So now fast action is trying out a new dancer. Who's also a rapper. And the new guy has heard of spiders. He's heard of him. You know what? You know what? The one thing he's not an actor. Not really. No, I think. And yet he is one of the more electric people in the movie (laughs) because he comes back in the end. Uh, Yeah. So he's spiders up to no good. Tells this to fast action. But when we cut over to spider and find out that everything is going over to uh, going over. uh, We cut to spider. Get your shit together. (sighs) I'm cutting that out. We cut over. This is not Irie at all. (laughs) Fucking keep it in. It's all Babylon. (laughs) Well, we cut to we cut over. So, so, I and I, I and I and Babylon. <laughs> yeah, so we cut over to Spider. Find out that everything is going according to plan. His henchmen are putting all the pieces in place. So now, back at the pizza place, Joey meditates on the. I think that's. I think that's also when we get hit the reveal of his grill. Uh, yes, because it's just like, hey, can we get more offensive? Absolutely. Yeah, because they're just gonna they're just gonna grill the first two teeth. So back at the pizza place, Joey is meditating on the counter while Polly tells a story about how his mother interrupted him having sex with some girl. And it's a real weird conversation that involves an impression of a Jewish mother. Yeah, I again, uh, this is again, these are those moments like like I said earlier, this is that like when white when wealthy white people or middle class white people are be like, hey, the thing you said was kind of offensive. Can you not say that again? And their reaction is what? Yeah, yeah. It's that where it's just like, what do you mean? I can't do with this awful, like anti-Semitic stereotypical performance. Like, God damn, man. Yeah. <sighs> Come on. Yeah. And they let you know it's okay though, because the kid's wearing a yarmulke. Yeah. So now sure Conrad gets a delivery run over to a hospital. 
noise. So now we cut to a montage of breakdancing and delivery boys <laughs> doing their half naked basement stuff. And, yep. and Max busy having sex with the rich lady in a scene that involves his naked butt bouncing up and down on the bed. Well, co- so it's the standard yeah. stuff. So while Conrad rides his bike over to the hospital, all set to a schmaltzy pop song about the delivery boy who delivers. But it's all like uh, tongue in cheek, uh, double entendres about like, uh, you know, delivering the goods to some some lady, presumably the singer. Now, at the hospital, we find one of Spider's henchmen, Jazz Mace, doing this really <laughs> doing this really fucked up minstrel <laughs> thing. It is it is some real heckle and jekyll shit. It's, it is some real like I ain't never seen an elephant that could fly. It's, it's that. It is, it's like real bad. Oh god, it makes me feel bad. Also, watching. cut that out, please. <laughs> <laughs> Do not leave that shit in. Uh, that is what it is. Yeah. Oh, it's it's so the big like the big wide eyes and the blinking and the like the mammy shit. Like, oh man, what was the direction for that? Because the uh, he's doing it, and the other two guys are like Nazi doctors. I you know I kept reading that like they kept saying that like oh they're like Nazi scientists, but they just have like German accents, which was kind Look, of we're like- halfway through this. And the question the listener wants to know is, are they both drunk? <laughs> and the answer is no, not really, No, but no, this movie just does not make any sense from front to back. No. But uh, yeah. So, so as if on cue, Conrad enters the scene. He brings the pizza to the lab where the doctors ambush him with a sedative needle and they throw him on the examination table. And and one of them says, oh, you brought two boxes of pizza. Because that's how you refer to pizza, right? <laughs> yep. So with two of the delivery boys now captured, Spider watches his boys break dance as one of the delivery boys does this monologue in a church where he prays to God to let the crew win the contest. And if they do, that he'll be okay with being a loser or something. And it is, this is insane poverty porn, this whole scene. But it also feels like a weird kind of knockoff of like, like a pony boy monologue. No, you know what this, this, um, have you ever seen Mean Streets? Yes. There is, it's when, it's uh, when De Niro's in the church. This feels very much like that scene where it's like, I know I don't, I, I never amounted to much. And I'm probably never going to amount to much, but just like, give me this one thing and then I'll be fine with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's on the waterfront. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. I could have been a contender. He, this guy is very clearly trying to act because he's doing this very seriously. But again, it, yeah, but he's such a bad actor. Yeah. Like in, in the scene, like the way the shot is composed is shit. Like everything about the scene is so fucking terrible. That it feels farcical in a way that's like kind of hilarious, except you, you can't understand a word he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you're going to give this big moment to somebody in your movie, I mean, a big moment in this movie doesn't amount to shit. But like, if you're going to give it to someone who you can understand. Yeah, I know. This, this is, again, this is one of those sort of like nameless characters in the movie who's basically been abs out the whole movie up to this point, even in this point. Like he's wearing the little cutoffs and the fucking half shirt in this scene where he like kneels down and like prays to God to like just let him win once. Such a fucked up scene. What the deal? What is it, it would be it would be as much at home in like drop dead gorgeous as it is in this movie. <laughs> yeah. So um, finally, Angelina snaps Joey out of his meditation by sending him downtown to a gallery with six boxes. Also, I want to step back just for a minute because. While Spider's crew is doing this, Spider doesn't dance, obviously, because uh, Mario and people. He is not a dancer. He is so into them. He is so. Like he is going for it. He's just like, I am the star of this moment. And all he's, he's just yelling shit like, yeah, man, I read. But, and it's but like, he's oh, also like down. God on, bless you, Mario and people. He's also like down on all fours and shit, but also yeah. the wind is blowing like crazy because yeah, it's it's march underneath the brooklyn bridge and he's got this crazy coat that's like billowing in the wind it's a very yeah. strange scene he is <laughs> so so into his dancers he must have i want to f- i how can i get tomorrow of envy i would love, I, mean, I bet i could actually get tomorrow of probably, just, pretty easily. probably just call him if up. i needed to i could but if i ever met i have him. access i have access to 
weird things, and I bet I could get my way to him. <laughs> let's let's do that. That's going to be like a fucking extra, like a bonus. We'll get Mario Van Peebles, mm-hmm. and we're just going to question him about this movie for like three hours. And then I'm gonna I'll, I'll be like, okay, but can you just you do the I, the uh, yeah man I re part? And they'll be like, <laughs> nope, call done. Yeah. So uh, yeah, she uh, Angelina gives Joey six pizzas to bring downtown to a gallery. So meanwhile, Max. Because you're like, hey, can this shit get any more ridiculous? Yes, it can. It's gonna. So Max is basically trapped as a sex slave to this rich lady. Now he tries to leave, but she has a vicious dog in the house who, I quote, hates delivery boys. And what would her father, who is in the house, where what would he think were he to see Max sneaking out of her room? Yeah, hey, everybody, this is coded language. This is called coded language. <laughs> yep. So now at the hospital, two sexy nurses hook Conrad up to all the machinery and then proceed to perform a strip tease to another it, one of it, ha- Handler's schmaltzy tunes. It's not going to make any any sense at all. Nope. I mean. Uh, nope. But. It, the, He's the, moved by musical theater. Yes, get it. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to seek shame. This is here's the thing. Call anybody. Hold yet. hold that thought because there's a whole bunch of other shit that happens before that. So now at the gallery, Joey finds the place stocked with plaster casts of real people. A bunch of them are real people, actually, and a crazy sculptor who's about to show it all off to in a bu- weird way that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like you didn't need, these didn't need to be real people. Right. It's going to just been like real shitty plaster casts Cause the actual plaster casts are shitty plaster casts. I suspect that they made those and realized how fucking long it takes to make even a shitty one that they were like, no, 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 no. We're just going to airbrush these, these actors and have them stand there. So, in this weird, like the uh, kind of like he, uh, Joey gets sort of Shanghai and conscripted into this like eyes wide shut party. I uh, yeah. So he finds it. And he's, he's about basically this crazy ass sculptor with like goofy facial hair, like something stolen. Oh, you mean you mean Gabe Kaplan? <laughs> yes, it's just stolen. Straight. Televisions, televisions, Gabe Cotter. Yeah, state stolen. Wait a minute, that's not really him, is it? It's not, but it feels like a fucking Gabe Kaplan character. It does, yeah, it does. But he, uh, yeah, so. This is like a scene from like uh, After Hours, like very clearly taken yes. from After Hours. As I was watching this, I was like, this feels like they saw After Hours and then shot this. Yep. So, yeah, I hope nothing bad happens to any of those statues. So everything is going fine. The sculptor goes to get the money to pay Joey. But while- Everything's coming up Kaplan. Yep. So everybody- but while he's looking at the statues, Spider's other henchman, Wild Man, pushes Joey into the sculpture, knocking it over and shattering it. Whatever will he do? So we're going to have to wait a little while to find it's out. It's a conundrum. Because we got to go back to the bridge where the rest of the delivery boys realize that the three of them are missing and nobody has heard from them. So Max, meanwhile, the timeline, the whole timeline of this movie is strange. Yeah. Yeah. So Max is now held up as a slave for the rich lady who I think intends to have him fight some other dude to the death in the morning for her enjoyment. And then now we never got to see that. I kind of wish we did. I know. And so now back at the hospital, we learn that Conrad has not responded to, at all to any of the sexual stimulation that they've thrown at him. But as a last ditch oh, he, effort, he needs musical theater. One of the doctors sits down at a piano that's been there the whole time, apparently, to play. And then Con- not just any piano. That is a Steinway piano. It's a Steinway. And he, and he plays. And uh, Do this- you think he brought that from home? <laughs> this is my personal stand up. I've got a, I've got a grand and a baby grand back at the uh, at the apartment. Because this is a very large, very expensive piano. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he, he begins to play Conrad, along with some woman who just shows up in very heavily costuming. Uh, they sing a very Broadway show tune duet with a woman, uh, which causes him to spring a massive erection. It's I, I don't. This is where the movie starts to. I, and this is going to sound really weird. This is where the movie goes off the rails. <laughs> this, I, this is where it goes it, off the rails i don't like it's so none of it makes any sense it, it, none of this movie makes any sense at all but it's just like why was I, I i imagine there were people who were there that were just like hey maybe uh here's how narratives <laughs> yeah you gotta start somewhere so you gotta you, you gotta point you, you work you your way to the middle and then from there you work your way to the end <laughs> the, the whole thing has a thread that connects all of it and I feel like Ken Handler was like, hey, 
You're fired. Get out of here. Get the fuck away from me. Yeah. Where's my where's my Steinway piano and that weird lady I just met outside? Bring her in here. (laughs) Because this whole movie has this feeling of just like it's pieced together. It was in in a way that makes sense to no one. There was a three page like treatment written for it. And then and that is you're being very generous. Yeah. And then they went to production and were like, oh, we should probably write down what we intend everybody to say. And they they just wrote it on set. And he was like, hey, man, when Kenneth Anger made fireworks, do you think he wrote that shit down? (laughs) And they were like, I don't know who Kenneth Anger is. (laughs) Or what fireworks yeah, is. Yeah, you fucking Philistine, you're fired. But this movie is not sexy, and all of your hustlers have stolen our shit <laughs> to buy blow. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this like, You can see a fine, like a very thin, fine covering of cocaine on every surface. It, like, it's just, none of the, like, these are, this is non sequitur after non sequitur. None of this shit makes sense together at all. There are musical numbers for no particular reason. There's a narrative thread that just keeps getting severed and severed and severed. The thing, nothing makes sense. The thing with Conrad that I I keep going. Anyone still listening to this? (sighs) God, I bless you if you still are. I I love you, but I I hope that I hope that this is the most riveting shit you've ever heard. But the thing of with Conrad that you're like, you started a new show to talk about this, (laughs) and the answer? Yes, I did. The thing that I deal with it about Conrad is that it's definitely pointing at a very specific joke. He's not, he cannot perform with women. He's not into the sexy nurses, but man, does he love a duet, but it does not pay off in any sort of meaningful way. Like it never says, Oh, by the way, this character is gay. He just eventually like, he, he eventually, you know, we'll get there. It's just, it's so fucking weird because it seems like it's going somewhere and then they chicken out. So there's a, uh, I don't, I, I don't know how else to explain this. I I make a lot of peanuts references because I do love (laughs) Snoopy and Charles Schultz. Now there's a period in peanuts history, uh, sort of post the uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas and uh, Halloween where they start to crank out these, what were essentially a series, but what they do is they take um, uh, they're basically just comic strips. They're animating the comic strips. And so what it feels like is a, they're trying to assemble an episode of a show from a series of comics, like random comics. Oh, sure. Like, these six, are not like, consecutive. Si- like three and six panel comic strips. Yes. And so they animate those. And then all of a sudden it's hard cut to something new. It's like, that's what this feels like. Yeah. Yeah. This feels like you have a, a, a collection of scenes of movies where they, no one's really thought through them very much. There's no narrative at all. And and it's just like, well, what if this happened? And then this happened. And then what if we made those things with uh, sex workers? Sure. <laughs> yeah. To keep costs. That's your fucking movie. To keep costs down. So, yeah. And, and what if what if it's just boner jokes mm-hmm. and fart jokes? Yep, I can't, that, that's this movie. I know. I kept seeing this movie. Res- what if Benny Hill was more lowbrow than Benny Hill actually was? <laughs> yep. It's and the thing is, I kept seeing this movie referred to very specifically as a boner comedy, as if that's a thing that like it is not. I, I've never heard that before. But like everybody who you know, and obviously we're like among like five people in the world who are talking about this movie. But the other four are called like oh yeah. Man. Seriously, everybody put this into the the fucking search in Spotify and see what comes back. Yeah. So uh, back at the uptown mansion, the rich lady's father and the vicious dog chase Tina, the housekeeper, up to her room. And we find out. Oh, Jesus, speaking of Benny Hill. And we find out that there's a hole from the hallway to her room cut into the wall at about waist level. It's a glorious hole, you might say. From the hallway, he basically tells her that there's no point but in it's, hiding. It's a, so it is a glory hole by way of Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> yes, it looks like a very comfortable one. This is some real fancy shit. Yep. So from the hallway, he basically tells her that there's no point in hiding and that she has to cooperate. Nothing gross about that. Not at all. It's going to get worse. Meanwhile, Max plots his escape, but the rich lady hid his clothes. And you're like, which one is Max? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, uh, She hid his clothes, but seeing her wig, he gets an idea and he breaks the fourth wall and turns to the camera and does this. I don't know. Kind of shrug. 
But so, so the woman, the the kind of hot mom that he's having sex with, she also does this earlier on where she breaks the fourth wall. And you're just like, again, uh, apropos of nothing, you're just like, I'm going to defy convention here in a way that doesn't make sense or matter. Yep. That's right. Oh, the failure to communicate bit. <sighs> I fucking hate that. Anyways, um, so so back at the glory hole, rich lady's dad sticks his dick through the glory hole causing Tina to run out the window. Now, Max, dressed in the rich lady's clothes and wig, is caught by her father trying to escape. So improvising, he explains that the agency sent her over to be the new maid, which her father is very happy about. So he shows her to Tina's... And he's doing it all in a very, like, kind of uh, high-pitched voice that is so obviously not a woman. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And so he shows her up to Tina's room and points out the glory hole which he keeps there because he likes to keep a deep and close ongoing relationship with the people who work for him, which is apparently what he told Timac when he offered him a role in this very movie. Timac. Yeah, Ty-Mac, I read that as well. Timac is the guy who plays uh, Bruce Leroy in The Last Dragon, by the way. So, yeah, another another moment of Ke- fucking Ken Handler just telling on himself. So Max It's like, again, it's this weird, like, exploitation of poverty. It's like, it's so fucking gross and creepy. Like, the more, like, I want, this movie is hilariously bad, but the more it goes on, you're just like, I, it's hilariously bad, but I also feel really bad about it. It's, yes, it's debauched in a way that's like, there is a class of people who really fucking behave this way. You know? Yeah, it's like it's like reading uh, Marquis de Sade, and you're like, <laughs> I, I get it, but also I don't like it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm surprised that this guy didn't just like throw a handful of bills at the floor and be like, "Pick this up, slave." You know, like that kind of shit. Yeah. Like, because that's that's really the, the. But he had also nailed them all down to the floor. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So. He had glued all the quarters to the floor yeah. and was just watching them try to pry them up. So now Max has this plan. He convinces the rich guy to go and get a can of whipped cream. And while he does, uh, well, he goes off to do his thing. Tina climbs back in the window and Max explains that he's going to get the both of them out of there with this plan. So when the rich guy comes back, Max covers his dong, the rich guy's dick, in the whipped cream <laughs> And then lets the vicious dog in, which be- in the most 80s shit you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which begins to happily lick the dude's dick. Now, rich guy handled, Max and Tina break out, and Max rides back down to the pizza place in drag while Scandal does some breakdancing in the church. So back of the hospital, Conrad is all done being experimented on, but now he's got an even bigger problem if you get my drift. He cannot lose the boner. And Max is having a whole bunch of misadventures trying to ride a bike in high heels. And this and the song, too. Yeah, I believe because he's riding a bike to a song. It's like, we're going to make it. We're going to make it's it. It's like, we're going to make it song. And it, it, much like the we're the delivery boys, not the rap, but the other one, this sort of like Broadway stroll yeah. that they do. It's this like real brassy, uh, a little bit body. It's like it is from another era. Yeah. Yeah, it feels uh, very cabaret. And there's everything about, like, there are so many moments in this where I was just like, this shit feels like a 80s TV montage. Yes. Oh, shit. Yes. All of those songs have 80s, like, family sitcom theme sounds. Yeah. yeah. So now, down at the gallery, Angelina is there to see what became of Joey, who is now made up to look like one of the statues. And the stuffy art scene people discuss the statues like a bunch of assholes while Joey farts in their face. <laughs> like I, uh, I, my, my, my notes actually says a fart joke, an actual <laughs> fart joke. <laughs> and it's another one of those moments where the actress like spends like five minutes making a fucking face, but while looking directly down the barrel of the camera, like, am I right, guys? So like they so they all everybody enters this scene as though like they they're acting as though they've never seen art before. Yeah. Or they've never seen statues before. Like one of them is like, well, what a remarkable ass. And I was like, "Uh, well, not really, lady, but fine. Yeah. Uh, It's just it's all very like, let's linger in the moment. Isn't it hilarious? No, it's not hilarious. It's gross and weird. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, yeah, now this is the thing is this movie is jerking all over the place because now we're going to go back to Conrad who can't get who can't ride back to work because someone stole his bike, which he says out loud, attracting the attention of a local cop who wants to know what his deal is. And so now the boner is. In- this is the first realistic moment of this movie. <laughs> yeah, the- because the cop is real aggressive with him. Yeah. So the uh, the boner is now event is is now revealed. Uh, when the cop is dis- but when the cop is distracted by an old lady who stole some guy's radio, Conrad again for for no particular reason. It's supposed to be funny because like he like the black guy is the one who is- yeah because he again is a a pretty big stereotype. Yeah, it, it's the black guy is reporting that this old white lady stole his his radio. When wouldn't it be the other way around, right, guys? Exactly. Yeah. Therein lies the joke, yeah. y'all. Yeah. So while this is all happening, uh, yeah. John Hughes, eat your heart out. <laughs> so uh, Conrad runs away and catches the bus. Uh, during a bumpy bus ride back downtown, he rubs his junk against. He kind of fucks a lady. Yeah, he rubs his junk against a woman. Maybe. Uh, and a few minutes later emerges from the. And by that, we're talking about possibly sexual assault. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Not possibly. This is rape. 100%. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, he uh, rubs his junk against her. A few minutes later, emerges from the bus bonerless, having satisfied himself Ugh. with sexual assault. Problem solved, everybody. Problem solved. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I picked this movie. <laughs> sorry I thought it was funny. Uh, so, I already said I I was high when I watched it the first time. I, I, I wasn't the second time. And I, then I realized what I had done. Yeah, but, man, we commit. We commit. So at the gallery, we learn that Joey has to take a leak because he's been holding it for so long. So An- oh, Angelina no. helps him out by holding champagne glasses under his business yeah. while he lets go. Well, first he says, I thought you'd go for this sort of thing. Oh, what? What? That's- and then she says, well, this is fun, like milking a cow. See, okay, so- oh, so that's how it works. Okay, Angelina, a couple questions. First of all, have you never seen how anyone urinates, including yourself? <laughs> Second of all, do you know what a penis is? Uh, third of all, what the fuck? Yeah, it kind of goes back to that whole, like, you're a pig, I'm a pig thing. So, uh, so yeah. This is a man who has never touched a woman. Yeah, so now. Or come near one, or talked to them like a human being. <laughs> so, uh, because everybody in the place is a stuffy asshole, they drink the piss from the champagne glasses and don't seem to notice. So now. Finally, because isn't it funny? Yeah. So now, finally. Oh, and also, there's a whole thing now with um, Joey's mother. Like, Spider calls her and is like, "Your son's in trouble at this gallery. Uh, you should probably go over there and help him." And she like sees him like bent over, like doggy style, trying to hide from her. And then she spanks him, and he runs away. And like, this is kind of how he gets to the big dance contest. So like. It's resolved in a really fucking strange way. Now, I what I feel, and you know what would be better from this movie? A documentary about this movie. <laughs> because I the thought process that 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 takes us from A to B to C, I, it is so inobvious that I'm just like, how did you get to this? How did you get how did you get us here? Yeah. Yeah. How did we get I, to Gabe Cotter's uh art show? And now there's a possibly Italian stereotype spanking another kind of Italian stereotype. Yeah, there's there's certain there's certainly movies out there that are just so bizarre that I'm just like, I have got to know everything there is to know about this because I just I need to understand the mind that that I will say I bought this Blu-ray because I wanted to see the interview on the disc. Was it illuminating? It was a man trying very hard to not say mean things. <laughs> That's what it was. Oh, no. It was someone who was like, the man is deceased. Don't say anything rude. Yeah. So as the dance contest. Finally- now, was it worth five dollars? Yes, it was. Oh, is that all you paid for it? I think so. OK. God bless Kino Lord. I know. There's your cheap ass releases that you got from somewhere else. Yep. Those sales, man. Every now and then I'm just like, oh, don't spend the Look, money. Don't uh, spend y- the money. You wanna you wanna trick me? 
Flash some cheap shit in my face. <laughs> Wait. Did I just five minutes ago order a Bruce Lee box set because 25 minutes ago I said, hey, remember that Bruce Lee movie? Yeah, that's how my mind operates. <laughs> that's why I own dumb shit yep. and have no money. So now as the dance contest fires up, Spider is assured by his guys that the delivery boys are indisposed while the sponsor of the event, a lame white guy investor of some sort, Oh, it, are you talking about Aaron Goldblatt? Yes, exciting. An offensive uh, Jewish stereotype who I feel like was maybe supposed to be played by Divine. <laughs> maybe because he does this not have a very like Divine's oh, character, yeah. oh, the yeah. male character he plays in Hairspray. In Hairspray, yeah. Or also in a uh, similar character in Crybaby. Yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, because what he does is he very excitedly condescends to everybody in attendance about how breakdancing is going to solve all the ghetto problems. Yeah. My note just says jaw dropping. Yes. It's very fucked up. It's so strange. Like even I was like gr- clutching because at pearls. It, it is someone, it is someone uh, making a, uh, a sort of cultural uh, criticism mm-hmm. in a moment where it's like, yeah, but you're also doing the same thing. Yep. Yeah. So now Max arrives at the contest and finds out that two more delivery boys are missing. So he talks to his brother, the drunk, who no longer dances, and he says, you got to dance Oh, you contest. mean Izzy? Who Izzy. just can't do it? Because it's just too late for me. Yeah. He, he, it's just he, too late for me. I can't do it. You got to save them. Like, I, I don't even know who you are. You were in the movie one time earlier. Yeah. And there's no indication that he was ever a good dancer. We just have to kind of roll with it. So, yeah, uh, the battle now commences. The delivery boys down two men hit the floor anyway, with Max still in drag. But the battle eventually turns into a fight. So ish kind of. Yeah. Sexy dance fighting. It's just it's guys who just can't keep their hands off each other. With Mario Van People still doing some real racist. shit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with not much- because he they keep cutting back to him and he is. I'm not going to do it. I, I, I'm fighting my instinct. I, I'm not going to do it because it's offensive, but <laughs> he's doing some real Mr. Wong shit. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So God damn with not, not much else to do. Izzy. So sorry, everybody. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know how we got, to, how we got to this moment. Yeah, so, I mean, like, I do, but I wish I did. This is you're, you're experiencing my moment when we were like three quarters of the way through elves. And I was like, what the fuck have I done? This was, this was not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, Izzy ju- now finally jumps on stage, proceeds to dance in a style that is definitely not break dancing, but you just do it. No. You do what you do, I guess. Now, meanwhile, Conrad and Joey also show up and jump on stage and dance in a style that is also not fucking break dancing. while well, fast action and one of the unnamed delivery boys grab Spider and dump him in a big pot of chili. Well, I didn't realize it was chili at first. I was like, are they are they dumping? In, is this hot chocolate? Is this sludge? <laughs> right. But what is this? Then and like, then all of a sudden he's like, oh, you can't put me in a chili, man. I hate and I was chili, like, man. Oh, no. Yep. Oh, chili. Yep. Oh, goddamn. So, yeah. So now with. That's terrible looking chili. It looks too. so fucking gross. It looks so gross. Like that's, that's the, that's the problem. It looks here. like, you know what it is? The chili's the problem. You know what it is? It looks like fucking food from you can't do that on television. I wish it was. Yeah. I, I wish I was anywhere else. <laughs> well, you're you're in luck because we're almost done. So I have literally been talking for four hours. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I don't have anything left in me. The, the devil dogs are now defeated. The delivery boys do a big show and are declared the winners for some reason. Now lift it up on the show. And- and scene. Yeah, lift it up on the shoulders of the crowd. Izzy and Max drink it in. Freeze frame. Fade to black. Roll. And you think the movie's hands. over. Except it's not over. What, did I skip something? There is a song at the end of this movie. Oh, okay, because as soon as the credits rolled, I was like, I'm out of here. Fuck this. Oh, then you missed a, a, a bewildering close to an already bewildering film. <laughs> oh, no. Because there is a very long song. I noticed that because that there's... They sing. What, the Delivery Boys? Yes. Oh shit! Now I gotta but do- it's all of them sitting around a fire. See, now that's the and thing is when I clo- when I closed it out, I was like, "There's like there can't possibly be ten minutes of credits for this movie." So there's like a Marvel credits post credit scene. Uh, no, it, it doesn't go 
straight to the credits. It, it it's they so the movie and so what uh, what it clearly happened. So again, uh, Larry Ravine. I'm gonna say Ravine. I don't know his name, but Larry Ravine said he they, basically with regard to this ending, he says, "I'm pretty sure they got to the end of the film and realized that it did not meet the minimum runtime." Ah. So they had. He was like, either that or Ken Handler was drunk. <laughs> because there's no way to explain it. and that is him saying that not me i'm funnier than him uh obviously but it, it clearly this is a thing that is just tacked on to the end because it is all of them all of the people you've seen in this movie as though they're not in character anymore not quite anyway yeah and they're all sitting around a fire on a beach or uh under the bridge i i don't really know it doesn't matter and they're singing a song and it's is it max he's the the sort of skinnier one mm-hmm. uh he sings a song and it's like it's this big triumphant moment it's a big triumph i i can't believe you missed it it is my jaw when i watched this movie was on the fucking floor because i was like what how did what who is it? I don't, <laughs> this can't be right. And it is, he's basically narrating the trials and tribulations of all of them. Meanwhile, we've got a sort of, uh, uh, montage scenes that where the transparency is a little bit low. And so it's like, they're kind of underneath this, uh, singing in the round moment. I don't know how to describe this. It is a, uh, it, uh, uh, it's like if the Rocky theme song was playing while Rocky and everyone else in the movie was just sitting around a campfire, really <laughs> just reminiscing about what had happened in the movie. Is it a, uh, the lyrics about what happens? Pretty much. So it's They're like this- about like how we overcame the struggle and how we're such good friends. Oh, God. And he is not a good singer. I mean, one of the lines is, while we was creeping through all our schemes. <laughs> and that's the thing about the songs in this movie is they're sung by the actors. Yeah. They don't need, to, you paid for this movie out of your own pocket. <laughs> you don't need to have them. You could just pay someone a thousand dollars to sing. A, you can get Bonnie fucking Tyler mm-hmm. to sing this song for you. And he could have but afforded you it. Have, you have the little Puerto Rican boy you're trying to fuck, he's singing it instead. I don't know how to describe it. I, I, I am so sad about all of this. <laughs> I know. There are, th- there are times in this movie where I kind of think that like they were... I made such a bad choice here. <laughs> it, it, it seems like they were they were trying to follow through on a promise to like, I'll, I'll showcase your talents, kid. And, and like, <sighs> the problem is, is that the kid had no talent. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I, he's, he must be great at other stuff. No, maybe, maybe he's really nice. Yep. He seems, you like know, maybe a, he, maybe he works well with elderly people. I wonder what he's up to these days. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. He probably fucking died in the nineties. The look on your face says you already know what he's up to. I don't, I have no idea. When I looked up, I looked up scandal and apparently he's a, he's a musician these days. So, okay, well he's not dead. So that's uh, above and beyond half the, the cast here. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm really sorry, everybody. I, <laughs> I I thought this would be fun and funny, and, and it turned out it's just not. Yeah, it's we, sad. It, it, it made me sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, you know, we at least we've got Bronx Warriors. Well, that that was the dark side of gay culture, right there. Holy shit. Yep. <sighs> a, a bizarre artifact of the 1980s uh, that was pretty much forgotten for a fucking good reason. Yeah. I mean, this one, it really feels like it was gone as soon as it came. Like everybody just wanted to put this shit behind them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like if I was just like, uh, Hey, Mario Van Peebles, let's talk about delivery boys. And he's like, well, I got a better idea. What if we talked about rapping instead? <laughs> I'd be like, well, I haven't seen it yet. I bet it's good, but I wanted to talk about this. And he'd be like, well, I, I gotta go. Let me tell you, let me tell you about heartbreak Ridge when I worked with Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Like, no, no. Tell no, me no, about no. Ken Handler. And he'd be like, I, I don't want to tell you about Ken Handler. I signed a bunch of shit that says I can never tell you about <laughs> Ken Handler. 
Like it just, I I don't feel good about this movie. <laughs> no. Talk about a wild turn. No, no. I feel like I feel like we've got some we've got some movies that we both that we both sort of hit at the same time, and we're like, what the fuck are we watching? I hope that the the other examples of the ones that we've got scheduled uh, work out a little bit better. Like I'm pretty sure X Ray is going to deliver in in ways that, that oh, we well that we anticipate. No, see okay. So this is I, I I think I watched this a couple of weeks after I watched X Ray, and X Ray was a very similar experience to me where I was just I had this. I'm pretty sure the whole time I watched the movie, I had this like, what? Oh, who's? No. <laughs> it's that kind of reaction. It, and I I think in my head, it all works out a lot different. When you're watching these movies with other people, you're like, isn't this hilarious? Then you really dig into it. You're like, oh, it's it's not hilarious. It, it's it's not. It's a, Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a 90 minute document of a man basically confessing his crimes to the to the world yeah like uh did you ever want to watch a movie where a really really rich guy exploits really poor people for uh, 72 minutes <laughs> and then adds a music video at the end the answer would be no mm. i mean the answer should be no yeah. uh, and, but i did and i thought it was funny and, and i'm sorry yep yeah. yep yeah. All right, let's 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 get past this because we've got a we got another movie coming up in two weeks. Um, what are we doing? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna help you out with this one. We're doing uh, we're doing Bozidar Benedict's really really bizarre uh, movie. I've been describing as an. You thought I would remember that name? I would remember. It's a fucking because he's also got a guy named Lazar Rockwood in it. Okay, that name I do. Yeah, remember. so we're doing Beyond the Seventh Door, which is a terribly terribly Canadian anti movie uh, that is one of the last of the, the of the sort of uh, tax shelter movies. And the result is bewildering and strange and just completely devoid of charisma. But uh, listen, I promise they're not all going to be like this. <laughs> no, we'll we'll celebrate. We'll celebrate our wins. So, uh, yeah, be back here in two weeks when we do Beyond the Seventh Door. <laughs>